Life is an ocean of mysteries. Standing at the beach, one can hear the waves whispering its secrets. Plants rebelled against the human race. Aliens allergic to water invaded a blue planet. And a cosmic miracle descended upon us and blessed the cinema with awe-inspiring ideas beyond the comprehension of the human mind. Some said he's the next Spielberg. Some went as far as to compare him to Hitchcock. And I am among the fortunate many whose lives were changed by his aura of creativity. The one and only M. Night Shyamalan. This genius shook the world with the sixth sense, a movie that is actually great. It was so great that it coupled Bruce Willis' name with spoiler alerts. Then he augmented his career with two conceptually unique and well-received movies. Then he made The Village and people started scratching their heads. And then he turned into one of the most incompetent filmmakers of all time. Or one of the most brilliant, I don't know. I laughed during The Happening more than I did with many good comedies. So maybe he's still a genius, one whose vision we cannot fully grasp. I mean, you can see that, just listen to our voices. We're perfectly normal. On oh, Blackwater, keep on rolling, Miss. Don't you keep on shining on me? See? We're normal. Since then, every time I hear about a new M. Night movie, I buckle up for the wild adventure that will ensue. The supernatural phenomenon that will make some of the biggest stars look like bad child actors on their first take. And with every work of his, M. Night astonishes me with his nonsensical writing and inept direction. So when I heard that he was making a movie titled Old, adapted from a graphic novel that explores complicated themes like mortality and existentialism, I knew we were about to witness a wrinkled philosophical disaster. And after I sat down and watched it, I was not disappointed. That the life is not the same as it How do you react to that? is actually the right word that we have here hanteerd. That, that was by me also my first warning that I thought that that can not that that uh, that. <laughs> Sorry, Of course, if you liked the movie and were able to take it seriously, then you all are gonna leave right now. I'm just kidding. No, this video shouldn't upset anyone because I won't be targeting the movie's audience. I will simply go over the plot and explain in detail why I personally think that this is one of the funniest movies of the last few years. Which requires getting into spoilers, so if you haven't watched all yet, maybe you should come back later. As the movie starts, we are introduced to the couple Guy and Preska and their kids Maddox and Trent. They were heading for a vacation at a luxurious resort called Anamica, which Preska had found on the internet. Inside the tourist bus, we hear Maddox singing the main title song, Remain, and we get a taste of the awkwardness with which the story and its themes will be presented. You have such a beautiful voice. I can't wait to hear it when you're older. Yeah, I can't wait to hear it when you're older. When the family arrives, they are welcomed by Discount Saul Goodman here, who is the resort manager. And the hostess serves them cocktails the minute they arrive. Before you see the place, before you even sit down, guzzle up these drinks. There's absolutely nothing suspicious here. Maddox and Trent get some drinks of their own, and while they're filling up, they meet Edlib, the manager's nephew. He and Trent converse as awkwardly as possible. And I'm not gonna blame the kids, I mean they're not great actors or anything, but the real disaster here is the dialogue. They could bring the best child actors ever, and they wouldn't be able to make some of these interactions sound natural. It's almost like M. Night never heard a kid speak before. I can do a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, which is a considerable thing to do. 
I collect conch shells. I have 42 conch shells. The family enters their suite, the kids start playing and jumping around, and here we learn that Guy is an actuary when he describes in numbers the rate of furniture related accidents to get them to stop playing. And Gael Garcia Bernal tried so hard to be convincing while his character is throwing statistics at his kids. He then gives Prisca a presentation about a pharmaceutical company called Warren and Warren when he finds their brochure just lying on the bed. Now you may want to ask, why in the world is there a pharmaceutical company brochure inside a resort suite? Well, stay tuned, because there is a Shyamalanian twist on the horizon. And heed my words, once this twist is revealed, the brochure placement will make even less sense than it already does. At this point, if you're already thinking that the plot seems too heavy-handed, watch how the theme is presented. You found the place? Yes. Oh, Briska, come on. You're always thinking about the future! I'm imagining M. Knight sitting on his desk, brainstorming all the possible ways of introducing the theme, and when he couldn't come up with anything within like 5 minutes, he said screw it, and just have the main characters yell it at each other. Now, I don't think spelling out the themes is inherently a bad thing, but at least spell it out at the right time, maybe at some critical point in the story, and build up to it, let the events drive the dialogue, not the other way around. And the dialogue itself should escalate gradually, have the characters argue back and forth, one claim leading to another, rather than having them howl out of nowhere. The snooker scene from Spencer is an excellent example of how to incorporate the theme into the dialogue. Trent and Adlib spend some time together. They wander around helping M. Knight write the script by asking different characters about their jobs, because knowing everyone's occupation is of the utmost importance. I dare to say it's even more important than the plot itself, as we will see throughout the movie. Trent tells Edlib, let's be friends, contact each other through FaceTime, go to the same college, and become neighbors with mortgages. What is happening? Why are 6 year old kids talking about mortgages? Is the power of the beach already at work? I'm actually starting to believe that M. Knight never heard a kid speak before. And just in case this exchange wasn't cringe enough for you, this wonderful deleted scene will scratch that itch. Sorry kiddos, my bad. Edlib gives Trent encrypted messages, and upon decoding one of them, he reads the words, Ice cream eating contest tomorrow. Good thing he didn't decode the other one, or else the credit would start rolling. On a beach, we see a guy sitting down watching this girl as she's getting into the water, and it is dawn I believe. The time of the day here is critical, keep it in mind because I will bring it back later. The resort manager approaches Guy and Prisca to recommend a private beach within a nature reserve. It's a once in a lifetime experience, he says. Only certain guests are invited, and he obliges them to keep it a secret. Yeah? Yeah? You're like not even gonna ask any questions. Okay, let's just pack and leave again, I guess. There's absolutely nothing suspicious here. On another table, a woman is having a seizure. This man hurries to the rescue, and the exchange he has with her husband is very natural and appropriate for the given circumstances. I'm a doctor. I'm a nurse. My name is Jared. I'm a mechanic. My name is Bob. I'm a substitute teacher. My name is Anne. I'm a professional mourner. My name is Nancy. This other family is also apparently among these certain guests, as we see them join the tourist bus heading to this private beach, and they will be driven there by the man himself. As they arrive, M. Knight refuses to escort them or assist them with their bags. Guy notices that they're given an excessive amount of food, so M. Knight says, yeah, you'll need it because you have kids with you. And take a lot of this, they forbade them from bringing their passports with them. It's like the resort supervisors are trying their best to alert the group, but they're just so keen to see this beach that they know nothing about. The group goes through a narrow pass between the rocks, and up until this point, we haven't seen anything crazy filmmaking wise. But sit tight, because there's gonna be some wacky stuff in here. Some techniques that would have Hitchcock trembling in envy. Like the extremely slow motion used for this shot for no good reason. I mean, what, is this supposed to visualize the difference in time perception between the beach and its peripheries? 
But time moves faster on the beach as we will find out later, so shouldn't the footage be sped up instead? Anyway, the group finally gets to the beach. They set up parasols and we see that sitting in the background is the guy we saw earlier at dawn. However, the girl he was with is nowhere to be seen. Maddox recognizes him as the famous rapper Midsize Sedan. Hmm. Guy sees some coral reefs in the distance and calls his kids to come and see it, but he's in fact calling us to see it. Because that's the only way the movie can introduce a new plot device or theme, by having a character shouted in our faces. Maddox and Trent are playing with the doctor's daughter, Kara. And uh, uh, what's going on here? Is the cameraman having a stroke? In the sand, they find rusty cutlery from the resort, then they get into a game of hide and seek. Trent hides in the water behind a rock, but he soon finds out that this spot has already been taken. Ah! Ah! The girl we saw at dawn is dead, and the doctor, whose name is Charles, suspects mid-sized sedan. Meanwhile, another couple arrives, Jaren and Patricia, the woman who had a seizure back at the resort. They are met with the discovery of the dead body. Guy advises everyone to leave but he's interrupted by Charles' wife, Crystal, telling her husband that his mother is feeling unwell. Jaren tries going back to the forest to call someone since there is no signal at the beach. Of course there isn't. But as he enters the pass, he feels pressure in his head, blacks out, and teleports to the middle of the beach somehow. At first, I assumed that someone carried him. But later, several characters attempt to leave at the same time and they all get teleported back to the beach with no explanation. It's the magic rocks, I guess. Charles was tending to his mother when Prisca approached, asking him to come take a look at her son because his bath suit is getting smaller. So she had to construct a compelling argument as to why her son's trunks are more important than his mother's well-being. I curate exhibits for museums. I'm telling you this because I want you to trust me and not think I'm being hysterical when I say there's something very wrong with my child. I curate exhibits for museums, which means I'm not crazy. Does your mother curate exhibits for museums? Didn't think so. Now leave her and come take a look at my son. You know what? I take back what I said earlier. I don't think M. Night never heard a kid speak before. I think he never heard a human being speak before. Before Charles and Prisca could reach the kids, his mother dies. Patricia and Jaren take the kids aside to keep them from witnessing anything gruesome. And despite the escalation of the events, the movie never lost track of its priority, which is to announce everyone's occupation. I'm a chef. I'm a cop. I'm a dancer. What? He's a rapper! I'm an actuary. I calculate people's insurance rates based on their risk profile. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon and chief medical officer. I'm a nurse. I'm a psychologist. Well, my mom is an attorney and my dad is a dentist. I have a sister. She's a therapist too. I need to get to my sister. Jaren tries to guess the kids' ages. He tells Trent, you're 11, right? Trent says, no, I'm 6, which upsets Jaren because he thinks they're playing with him. Then Prisca comes back asking if anyone saw her kids as they were standing right in front of her. In moments like these, I start suspecting foul play. What if M. Night is intentionally making everything as ridiculous as possible just to troll us? He must know how silly this is, right? Prisca can't recognize her kids who are standing right there with the same hairstyle and the same bath suits. And there are no other kids around except for Kara. She was with Trent only minutes ago, and she noticed he was getting bigger, which pushed her to seek Charles' help. Why can't she recognize him now? According to the rules, which the movie explains later, half an hour on this beach is equivalent to one year outside. So, even if an hour passed since she left, and I'm being really generous with the time here, she couldn't recognize her own kids if they aged by two years? Is, it, is everyone trying to play a joke on us? Everyone is shocked to see that the kids have been recast. So they all decide to leave together, and all of them black out and teleport back to the beach. Guy and Prisca move away from the rest of the group to discuss their ordeal, as awkwardly as possible. We're on a beach with two unrelated dead bodies, that is just statistically impossible. This isn't the first time an M. Night character speaks in numbers amid an ongoing disaster. In the happening, there is a math teacher who insists on shoving mathematical equations in every situation, even when he sees dead bodies hanging from trees. I'm gonna give you a math riddle, okay? And you're gonna tell me the answer. What? 
Even though I find this kind of nonsense to be quite amusing, I can't help but feel bad for the actors who become the objects of ridicule as they tread through poor writing and misguided directions. For those unfamiliar with their work, Gael Garcia Bernal and Vicky Krebs are excellent actors. Movies like Amores Peros and Phantom Thread showcase their acting skills and absolve them from this fiasco. Guy and Prisca ask Charles to take a look at their kids, again. But Charles has his hands full at the moment. <laughs> Apparently, Charles has psychosis or dementia, they don't really specify. Miss Aysedan yells at Charles in shock, but then he tells everyone he's not feeling anything as his wound heals within a few seconds. This of course is all based on science. Accelerated aging turns the subject into Wolverine. Should be more interested in science, Jake. You know why? Because your face is perfect. The group recognizes a shared attribute among some of them. Each family has at least one member who suffers from a chronic disease. So they gather around to try to make sense of the whole situation. Meanwhile, the camera is aimlessly spinning. Prisca turns out to have a growing tumor, she passes out, and the cameraman doesn't give a shit. He's extremely dedicated to his spinning shot. The editor realizes how silly this is, so he cuts to a different angle. Yeah, this is much better. No? Not really? Someone keeps splashing- With Prisca in this critical state, it's up to Guy to decide what to do, and he decides to let Charles operate on her. Charles pulls his pocket knife and as he is about to operate, he starts racking his brain trying to remember the name of a film starring Jack Nicholson and Marlon Brando. You know, there are many effective ways to portray cognitive dysfunction. Forgetting a 70s film amid a surgical operation is not one of them. Especially when the goal is to create tension. I mean, that's the goal, right? I don't think the movie wants me to laugh at a mentally ill person, right? Charles snaps out of it and resumes the operation. But the issue is that Wolverine's healing power is in effect. To counter it, Jiren instructs the others to pull the incision apart. No need to sanitize your hands. Germs age rapidly on this beach. As soon as the tumor is removed, Prisca regains her consciousness and immediately falls in love with Guy all over again. Bear in mind that Prisca discovered the growing tumor, passed out, had surgery, recovered from the surgery, and reconnected with her husband all within the span of 5 minutes. He's trolling, I'm calling it now, he's just trolling us. The group finds out that the dead girl's body has already decomposed, and thereupon realize that their bodies are aging rapidly. Jiren suggests that hair and nails aren't growing at an abnormal rate because the cells in these structures are dead, which is nonsense. To elaborate, hair grows from hair follicles and nails grow from matrices under the nail base. Yes, the cells in the prominent parts of the hair and the nails are dead, but these dead cells do not grow on their own. They only get pushed outward by the living cells within these hair follicles and matrices as they continuously grow and multiply. Take an interest in science. Now, you may be thinking that I'm nitpicking here and that it is unreasonable to have the characters drag their abnormally long hair and nails behind them for the majority of the runtime. As a matter of fact, I don't care about characters' hair or nails, but the movie addressed it with pseudoscience, so now I have to think about it. The graphic novel on which the movie is based focused on the metaphorical aspect of the beach. And I think that is the right approach, because with these kinds of mysteries, especially within the horror genre, sometimes it's better to keep certain details ambiguous. Many horror mysteries with unique concepts terrify us by alienating their otherworldly antagonistic forces. Once a horror movie starts overexposing a supernatural threat, it becomes much easier for us to poke holes in it and much harder to suspend our disbelief. A suggestion is put forward to attempt to escape. It consists of crossing the paths very slowly to avoid the sudden shift in pressure in their heads. None of them agree to try it because they are afraid they might lose about 10 years of their lives. I suppose staying here and dying is a better option? Like you're not even gonna try it with one of the kids who have long lives ahead of them. Speaking of kids, something unholy is taking place inside the tent. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be laughing. This is actually very repulsive and I think the movie handled it very clumsily. Especially with how the parents reacted to the whole thing. 
None of them show any signs of shock or distress, they all just look mildly inconvenienced. Still, the state of the actors as they walk towards the camera, with the silly faces they were making and the baby walk they were trying to mimic, made for a very funny shot. Within seconds, the movie sends Kara into labor, completely disregarding Jaren's remarks here. If she walked into the emergency room, I'd say she's about five months pregnant. At this point, I don't think anyone is expecting any consistency from the movie, least of all the cameraman who has succumbed to his obsession with these spinning shots that track absolutely nothing. Shortly after, we hear the cries of a newborn and everyone was happy for about 30 seconds before we learned that the newborn died of neglect. Okay, the implication here is that the newborn was quickly dehydrated as a result of the time flow on this beach. By this logic, they all should be dead now, because unless they drink water like every 15 seconds, they should die of dehydration. That's what I meant when I said sometimes it's better to keep certain things ambiguous. In the graphic novel, the newborn lives and grows up all alone on the beach as everyone else has already died. It's a very grim conclusion to the story, but it's much more compelling than its movie counterpart and much more thematically relevant. I don't know what killing the newborn is supposed to add, thematically or plot-wise. What is the movie trying to say here? If you don't live your life moment by moment, your baby will dehydrate? Charles tells Crystal to put on some makeup because she's aging. First of all, your daughter just went through labor and your grandchild just died. Second, I don't see any sign of aging on her face. In a movie like this, you would expect them to put extra effort into the makeup to illustrate the rapid aging of the characters. So far, only the kids look older because they just recast them. The adult characters look almost exactly the same, despite the fact that they have aged about 10 years. And what's baffling is that the movie keeps drawing attention to this aspect. It insists that these characters look older when they really don't. Oh no, don't look at my imaginary wrinkles. The worst offender in this regard is Miss Sai Sedan. He has been here since dawn. If I take into account the apparent time of the day along with the advanced age of the kids, I'd say he spent at least 10 hours here, which should translate to 20 years. They didn't even try here. But that doesn't matter, because instead of 20 years, Miss Sai Sedan got 20 stabs in the chest. Guy carefully takes the knife away from Charles and puts it in Prisca's handbag right in front of him, so he knows where to look in case he wants to stab someone else. Jaren tries to swim around the rocks, it doesn't work out. Kara tries climbing the rocks, it doesn't work out. Am I the only one who thinks that slowly crossing the pass as suggested earlier is a far more viable and less risky option? Whatever. Patricia also dies after having a series of uninterrupted seizures. Notably, she didn't experience any attacks all this time. We'll find out why after the big reveal. Old age takes its toll on Guy and Prisca as the former experiences blurred vision and the latter loses hearing in one ear. And yet, both of them still look almost exactly the same. They put one wrinkle on each character and want me to believe that they are wasting away. If anyone wants to see how a movie can successfully present aging characters, look no further than Charlie Kaufman's I'm Thinking of Ending Things. With a modest budget, they achieved an incredible feat. Both the makeup and the way the actors carried themselves perfectly captured these characters at different stages of their lives. And the crazy thing is, I'm thinking of ending things doesn't even need this. Showing the aging process isn't nearly as essential for that movie as it is for all. It's just something Kaufman wanted to sprinkle to visualize one of the movie's many themes. In the evening, Charles sneaks into Prisca's handbag to retrieve his knife. Of course, because they put it in there right in front of him. They don't understand the concept of hiding an object. Charles attacks Guy who just keeps standing there taking these slashes. Prisca does the more sensible thing and runs off and tells her kids to hide. So they go inside a cave where they hear a strange noise. Trent then lights a match revealing a crazy crying crystal. I don't wanna be seen! Trent just loves taking other people's hiding spots, doesn't he? Crystal starts chasing and attacking them for no reason before she turns into a goblin because she has calcium deficiency or something. And even now, as she's taking her last breath, she still looks younger than me. Meanwhile, Charles is still viciously slashing Guy, but he's fine thanks to Wolverine's healing power. 
Then Prisca returns with a counter slash using a rusty knife from among the cutlery that her kids found in the sand. Consequently, Charles gets a tetanus infection, which apparently causes blackening of the veins. Take an interest in science. The movie here is not only being inaccurate with its depiction of the infection, it also wastes an obvious opportunity. The chief symptoms of tetanus include painful muscle rigidity and spasms that can be intense enough to break the patient's bones in extreme cases. So what the movie could have done here is to have Charles and Crystal die simultaneously and jump back and forth as they both break their bones. Guy and Prisca sit down on the beach, reminiscing about the good times and lamenting the bad times. They try to recall what their strife was about, but they can't, leading both to agree on the futility of it all. You know, this could have been a really poignant scene if A, the movie had properly built its characters, developed their relationships, and convinced me that these are actual people, not a bunch of actors bumbling through the weird dialogue. And B, if Guy and Prisca actually looked old, because right now, it's impossible for me to believe that they are dying of old age. I know I'm repeating myself here, but I just have to emphasize the movie's failure to meet the basic requirements of its concept. The day passes, and Maddox and Trent wake up the next morning alone and in their 50s. They sit down and watch the sea for a while. She asks if they should make another escape attempt, but he suggests building a sandcastle instead, which is a very random and strange thing to introduce at this point in the movie. Sandcastle is the title of the graphic novel on which Old is based. There, it has a clear thematic purpose. It serves as a metaphor for the futility of life. Something we spend a long time building and shaping, only to have it wiped clean by one wave. The movie introduces the sandcastle near the end without seeming to understand its relevance, because the metaphor will soon be negated by the happy ending that is about to be forced down our throats. As they are building the sandcastle, Trent remembers that Aidlib gave him another encrypted message that he did not decode. So Maddox tells him to do it. What happens next will shock you. After decoding it, the message turns out to be, my uncle doesn't like the coral. This is basically M. Night passing a note to his characters saying, give us a happy ending. As I said earlier, the graphic novel ends grimly with the newborn growing all alone on the beach. And the last thing we see is her building a sandcastle, an ending that perfectly encapsulates the essence of the material and fits way better than its movie counterparts. It's not that I don't like happy endings, but for a story that contemplates mortality and existentialism, a cookie cutter ending where the bad guys get what they deserve just doesn't work, especially when it's haphazardly slapped together. Trent tells Maddox this means that the coral will protect them, somehow. So they turn into Olympic swimmers as they dive through the coral reef. In the meantime, the movie introduces the villains responsible for the whole thing, the staff members of the pharmaceutical company, Warren and Warren. This was one in a series of clinical trials they were conducting to test different drugs, which is why they choose families with one or more members with chronic diseases. And luring them to this beach allows the company to test the long-term effects of any given drug without having to prospectively follow up participants over months or years. Now let me channel my inner academic and explain why this is arguably the worst possible method of conducting a clinical trial. To begin with, they dissolve the experimental drugs in cocktails. What if the subjects didn't finish their glasses? It would be impossible to know how much of the calculated dose was administered. What would then be the next step? Chase the subjects with these cocktails? Moreover, all drugs bar none have a limited duration of action. 12 hours, a day, a week, a month, then the drug or its metabolites are excreted from the body and another dose has to be administered in order to sustain its effect. There is no such thing as a single dose having an effect over the course of years, as happened with Patricia who received a drug that prevented a seizure attack for the equivalent of years. And there is nothing in the movie to suggest that drugs are unaffected by the rapid aging on the beach. If instead of a drug dissolved in a cocktail, the method was to place an implant under their skin that releases the drug gradually over an extended period of time, then that would have been much more believable. Additionally, clinical trials aren't just, let's see if this drug works or not. There are many other parameters to monitor, like the drug's concentration in the blood, its distribution, excretion, therapeutic index. 
How are they supposed to monitor all of that when the subjects are going to decompose in a day or two? I actually believe that it would be much easier and more rewarding to find willing participants and properly conduct the study on them. I don't think it's impossible for a company with this kind of power and resources to find people who are inclined to give away a few years of their lives in exchange for money. And going back to the beginning, if Warren and Warren intended to retain the secrecy of their experiments, then why in the world would they place their brochure inside the resort? Why would they associate themselves with this place? That being said, I must emphasize that I don't usually care about this stuff in a fictional movie. But in this case I do, because the movie itself keeps drawing attention to it. None of this crossed my mind while reading the graphic novel, simply because it didn't shoot itself in the foot by trying to explain everything with pseudoscience. Instead, the focus was where it should be, on the journey and the themes. Anyway, the resort manager lures in another family, but adult Trent smashes their cocktails. Meanwhile, a cop whom they had informed conducts his own investigations into the matter. How do they know this guy is a cop? I'm Greg Mitchell, I'm a cop. Ah, very clever movie. Memorizing everyone's occupation paid off after all. The resort manager tries to avert the situation, but it's too late. No more drink spiking, mister. Adlib recognizes Maddox and Trent and his reaction is very... Uh, the, the cop is here? Um, oh, the cameraman is at it again. Yeah, let's just stare at the sky. Old is another entry in the resume of a fascinating artist whose works went through such extreme downgrade that even a AAA game at launch day cannot attain. The movie took a unique concept and a well-established group of cast and crew members and smeared them with utter technical and narrative failure. It's just a waste of talent through and through with nothing to redeem it but the unintentional hilarity. And I'm giving it a 2 out of 10. What did you guys think of old and which one of M. Night's movies is the worst? Or the best, depending on how you look at it. Let me know in the comments below and if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to leave a like, subscribe and ring the bell. And I'll see you next time.